Good evening and welcome to Talk of the Stacks. I'm Christy Pearson with Friends of the Hennepin County Library. Now, for those of you joining us for the first time, Talk of the Stacks is a free author lecture series produced by Friends featuring guest authors who focus on the craft of writing across a broad array of genres and topics. Tonight, we are so excited to kick off our new season by celebrating the release of the Steger Homestead Kitchen with cookbook authors, Will Steger, Rita Mae Steger, and Beth Dooley. But first, on behalf of the library and friends, we would like to begin tonight with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that in Hennepin County, we live and work on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Dakota people. This land and the Dakota people belong together. And by offering this land acknowledgement, we commit to supporting indigenous nations and to holding ourselves accountable to the work of reconciliation. Thank you. Well, I would next like to recognize our generous sponsors who help make this free series possible. Many thank yous to the Star Tribune, LSE Architects and NOR Companies. Well, tonight's event is sure to offer us many new ideas for warm, healthy, delicious meals. But did you know that the Steger Homestead Kitchen is just one selection of an extensive cooking resources available at Hennepin County Library? We have more than 13,000 cookbooks in the general collection. And I did say 13,000. Our libraries offers a bounty of options to help you plan your next weeknight meal or perhaps baking adventure. Later in the program, we are going to share a link to some cookbook recommendations that was pulled together by our beloved librarians. So please stay tuned. Next, I have just a couple of tips to help you better enjoy your virtual experience tonight. If you are interested in captions, click on the closed captioning icon with a little arrow next to it and select show subtitles. And if you would like to ask one of our authors a question, you can log that question at any time in the Q&A icon. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's special guests. Beth Dooley is a co-author of the Steger Homestead Kitchen and the Sioux Chef's Indigenous Kitchen, a 2018 James Beard Award winner, in addition to more than a dozen other cookbooks. She's covered the local food scene here for more than 30 years, appearing in the Star Tribune, on CARE 11, NPR, and so many more. Tonight's special guest, Will and Rita Mae Steger, work together at the Steger Center for Innovation and Leadership in Ely, Minnesota, creating transformative wilderness experiences that inspire bold action and to improve the world. Best known for his legendary polar explorations, Will has been a formidable voice in calling for the preservation of the Arctic and our Earth for decades. He's the founder of Climate Generation, a nonprofit that empowers people to engage in climate change solutions. An author of four books, he is also the recipient of numerous awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from National Geographic Adventure. Will's niece, Rita Mae Steger, has been the Steger Center's chef for six years. She learned to cook from her Vietnamese mother and developed her understanding of Asian cuisine while living with relatives in Vietnam. Fluent in Vietnamese, Rita Mae has translated many of her family's recipes for American kitchens. It is such an honor to welcome Will, Rita, and Beth to Talk of the Stacks. I hope all of you enjoy the evening. Thanks for joining us. All right, Christy, thank you so much for that gracious introduction. It's a thrill to be here. Um, I wish we were all together, even at the homestead. And what's been so much fun is to go through the chat and see how many people are dialing in from all over the country. In fact, as far away as Alaska, which is just really, really wonderful. And it speaks to the importance of the work that Will is doing and the way that Rita May has brought that work to the page. Um, just by way of background, I have to tell you that this book 
the, the idea for this book, and I really have to credit John Ratzlaff, who I hope is on this call tonight. He is the photographer at the Will Center, at the Will Steger um, Homestead. And uh, he's done a marvelous job of giving you a sense of what that place is like. And, you know, I've always been um, an admirer of Will. I, he's always been a hero to me. And it wasn't until I went up there at John's, um, you know, recommendation that I check it out, that I understood that homesteading is not about going off and taming the wilderness. And that Will's work as an explorer is not about conquering the great North. It's really about understanding our world, understanding um, our earth and learning to live together in a way that garners our resources and brings us together into community, which I know is a word that's been overused so often, but up there you get the sense that everyone shares the values of um, sharing our resources and living more lightly on the earth. And what I was really amazed by was how artfully Rita May, who's a phenomenal cook, does that by paying attention to the seasons, using what she has available to her in a way that's extremely thrifty, but incredibly tasty. So with that, I'm going to let Will first um, talk a little bit about how he brings this notion of radical hospitality into his homestead, because much, I think, many of the stories in the book speak to the experiences Will had, not so much as a, you know, explorer under rough conditions, but as someone who um, really enjoyed the hospitality of people he had never met before and who had much different lives. And then Rita May, who worked so hard to make the people that come up to the homestead, whether they are coming from Summit Academy or whether they're dignitaries and politicians or whether they're students or artists or poets, all come together at the table and feel very much at home. So I'm, I'm gonna stop talking and let you guys take over from there. Thank you. Okay, but th thanks a lot, Beth. And thanks for your generosity and helping us you know, do, doing this book. It was really a mainstay of your work too. And um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, homesteading. And um, I was raised here in the city. Um, I bought land in the wilderness uh, off road when I was 19, back in 1964. and I. I had always wanted to live in the wilderness. My, that's what I remembered as a child, and and I was able to pursue that. And I moved to the wilderness in 1970. And and where I lived uh, north of Ely, it was a really raw wilderness. It was hard to get into. Uh, a lot of bugs and really super cold winters. Uh, but homesteading was what I would call living. Uh, well, my goal was self sufficiency, but it's what you would call it sustainability today. It was to build back out a, a home small home uh, started out to be a home small home in, in the wilderness but uh but the community was a really big big part of my efforts because I, here I was at 25 years old living moving into the wilderness and and i left my community in minneapolis behind and and uh my goal was to uh, form an extended community which basically were friends that i've worked with over the years developing courses and dog sledding but so many people that came up to volunteer their their time and and work for me as apprentices and masters and uh, and then over the decades we built up uh the the homestead which was the beginnings of uh, the the stiger center but at the, at, the, at the core of that was always the evening uh the the evening dinners but we what was unique about the, the homestead it still is that way early on we all lived in tents but we shared communally or around meals and and today we have ca some cabins and that but we still gather around our work and particularly around the, the table in the evening lunch is a great time we always uh, celebrate lunch we take a swim and that's a great time of the year a uh, great time of the day in the summertime but it's that evening meal that where uh, everything jives. And uh, since the very beginning, one reason I wanted to move to the wilderness and clear land, uh, I wanted to raise my own food. And, and back 50 years ago, there wasn't organic vegetables. Uh, if you wanted organic vegetables, you had to grow it yourself. Fortunately, at the beginning, there was a cooperative system uh, that the, now the, the co-ops that we have in the city. Uh, but back then I was able to buy um, beans and grains in bulk. Uh, that was our mainstay of, of grains but we lived we had very simple diet 
and very simple recipes. And recipe, we didn't even call it a recipe in a way it was kind of passed on by word of mouth. And it was more how to how to cook and prepare food, not so much of measuring out uh, things in real real detail. But but out of that was the birth uh, of this cookbook of of um, living simply, eating simply with simple ingredients uh, or all organic. All the ingredients on the in this cookbook, you could go to any co-op in Minneapolis or Whole Foods. You can buy all, all your food in bulk uh, and um, and real simple. And it's simple, it's simple to uh, eating. Uh, I, I kind of want to reintroduce people back to the simple living. I, I don't think people appreciate that maybe 20, 30 years ago or even 50 years ago. But but now I think uh, with uh, the environment that we're all concerned about, uh, it's a matter of uh, protecting our, our health, but also protecting the health of our planet. It's, it's a way of way of living of, uh, that's sustainable. And uh, eating simple, uh, once you, you try some of these recipes, uh, your body will start craving these simple foods. And uh, so it's a, it's a really great thing there. But hospitality and gathering and food uh, really go hand in hand. And uh, uh, I, I experienced so much hospitality in my years of travel. I, I've traveled in the Arctic uh, for at least 50,000 miles over my time kayaking, do dog sledding. And, uh, and I met many people way, you know, isolated trappers, a lot of native people, missionaries and so forth. And, and people were always so generous with their food. Even a lot of the trappers and the native families that lived way out trapping, uh, they were always so generous to share with me their, their best of their foods. And, uh, and, and it would almost would be a disgrace to turn that down. You know, you just naturally have to accept their best and, and also replicate that, that, that sense of uh, graciousness and gratitude. Gratitude is something that isn't, isn't something that you just wear on your sleeve and you, you're gonna have a period of gratitude. Gratitude. It, gratitude is really a value that you always have with you. And the native people and the trappers, the isolated people in the North always had that sense of simplicity, gra gratitude. And um, it always happened in unexpected ways too. And uh, I remember many times I, I would just show up in, a, in the middle of the winter in a village about one o'clock in the morning and the whole village would come out to hear this racket. And, and here's, here's a dog's team and a couple of people and it's 50 below outside. And, and, um, and I mean, we just simply have to, have to wait for the invitations, but there was always a, kind of a seniority because of the chief of the village and that is where you really needed to go and you had a, there was an etiquette involved in that, but it was just such a great thing. And I, and I, and I felt uh, on the cookbook with Beth's help and Rita May's uh, brilliance of, as a cook and a chef, she's our, we had cooks and chefs up there for 50 years, but uh, and not because she's just my niece, but she's the greatest <laughs> chef we've had up there. And uh, everybody remembers Rita May's cookings. And even vegetarians that are people that are meat eaters and have had no, another experience of eating vegetarian. Uh, they really, really like uh, uh, Rita May's food. And, and, and for one thing, it's sustainable. I mean, we work hard during the day expeditions. You work hard so you can sustain yourself real well um, on a simple diet. But um, Maybe Rita May, why don't you talk about the real food here and the and uh, what you put together here in recipes? Yeah, so um, I've been at the Steer Center for six summers now, and um, I am in charge of cooking for everyone who may be coming through. Um, the kitchen is located in the lodge, which means I'm the first people that uh, first person that people see when they come to the homestead. And so my day begins at about 6 a.m. in the kitchen and I'm cooking straight until dinner time. So the smell of food all day is just permeating through the screen windows of the lodge and people are always coming in and now like, Rita Mae, what are you up to? What you making for lunch, you know? And so um, they see my process every day for five days a week. And um, yeah, it, the meals are really important and people, I, I always try to make something for everybody. I always, if someone is new and haven't and hasn't, um, say, tried a beat before, I always make sure that there's something that they like there. So if it's cookies or sandwiches or a vegan version of something or a dairy-free version, there's always a big spread for everyone. 
You know, Rita, may I have to comment? I remember being up there and there was a, um, a guy who had been at Summit Academy and had graduated and is now an independent contractor. And he talked about how his experiences and how you had introduced him to a variety of vegetables he'd never had before. And before he came to the Steger Center, he'd lived off burgers and fries pretty much. And once he you know, got there and spent some time there and tasted what real food tastes like and sort of got over the fact that he couldn't find any French fries and he, he couldn't get any canned soda. He yeah. felt so much better that that was inspiration enough for him. And, and the result was that in the next year or so, he lost like 50 pounds. He quit smoking. I mean, the impact you're having on people because your food is so vibrant and it tastes so good. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, both your approach, like I've, I've watched you and it's so fun because it's so spontaneous. You see what you have and then you kind of create. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, I mean, I love vegetables. That's why I started cooking was to just make vegetables taste really amazing. And so I love them because they're colorful and they catch your eye and um, you can cook them in butter. You can cook them with garlic. You can always make it taste good. You know, you can add some bacon, whatever, but um, <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. And you, you source a lot of things from the garden, right? Yeah. From the steamer yeah. garden. And you also go to the farmer's market. Yeah, yeah. So I start my morning every day by harvesting vegetables and washing them, just prepping them for the week. And then on once a week, I'll go to the farmer's market mm -hmm. to get some eggs and some meat and um, maybe some bread. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing, I saw when I was up there with you is how well you're able to think about leftovers so that nothing gets wasted. Talk a little bit about your process of how you how you kind of plan meals so that you know if you have some left, you will know what to do with it next. Yeah, so I'll make sure if I'm making something to have leftovers, I'll make sure it's something that's going to keep well um, for a few days. And um, I also, there's always, always one designated day just to eat leftovers. And usually that's town day when yeah. I take the night off to go to the farmer's market. <laughs> well, I'll just go into the ice house and grab out all the leftovers. Yeah, that's great. The other thing I loved is you have a couple of recipes that you just make for yourself. Yeah. And I, I just, I think that's so great because cooks often forget to nourish themselves. Talk yeah. about where those recipes come from and how you came yeah. up with them. Um, so I, I cook for um, 25 people, three meals a day, but every meal I still go back to my cabin and make myself a meal. Um, just having that time alone to eat by myself in quiet is really important to me. Um, yeah, and, and it'll, it'll definitely be like a more simple meal. It's not, I don't make myself like a huge spread. Well, you turned me on to those blistered tomatoes and avocado toast. Yeah. <laughs> <Good. laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're really good. Also, I think what's really wonderful is the way you plan meals to cook over an open fire. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because, sorry, my computer just went out, went backwards. Um, because they, the homestead does have these wonderful communal meals down by the, um, the lakeshore in the summer. Talk a little bit about how that works too. Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's a collaborative event. Everyone will grab their own plate, their own fork, will fill up a wagon with ingredients. Usually I'll cook meat over the fire, um, sometimes in a cast iron or just like over the grates. Um, mm -hmm. We make hobo fries, which are uh, John Ratzloff, the photographer in the book. Um, he shot the cover. He um, he dubbed them hobo fries, so he would make those every Friday. Um, just like really more fried food, I guess. Down <laughs> the fire. <laughs> um, there's our kitchen in the lodge. Um, it's really old. There's a lot of character. It's really dear to my heart, but there's no ventilation in there. It's just old. So we go down to the fire. <laughs> uh, out in the open and will loves building fires too <laughs> well the nice thing about that fire is that it lasts and then people hang out and yeah. then stars yeah. come out and guitars come out and yeah. you know we'll harvest like water from the lake to wash the dishes um we'll do corn on the cob we'll keep it in um what's the the 
the shell of the corn, I forget what it's called, but uh, one trick yeah, we do is, yeah. yeah, the husk. Yeah. We'll dip the corn in its husk in the lake so that it's wet. And then we put it on top of the fire so the steam from the water will cook it faster. It's mm -hmm. great. It's yeah. really great. Um, you know, one more question. The, the influence um, of your family, you know, especially, I mean, what I loved is there's so many great stories that toggle between your grandmother, Steger, Will's mom, and your mom's mom. You know, Kim Chi is your mom and her mom, and you've traveled with her through Vietnam. Can you talk a little bit about the hospitality you received there as well? Because I think you really bring that into the homestead. Yeah, so in Vietnam, um, if you're first meeting someone or you're you're meeting someone you haven't seen for a long time, instead of asking like how are you, they'll ask you have you eaten yet. Yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> and um, uh, so eating meals there together is part of the culture. Um, so breakfast, actually, you don't make it at home. Everyone eats street food. So mm -hmm. at around from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., the whole neighborhood will be outside eating from different carts, different vendors, just you know, squatting on the ground with a bowl and some chopsticks. Um, that's breakfast. And then lunch and dinner is more of like a family affair. Um, so here, like when we're 18, we grow up and we go to college, we move out of the house, get a job, whatever. But in Vietnam, um, um, our elders raised us. So part of the culture is to reciprocate. So once you're old enough to, you are, you're there with your family. And so it's really common to see households with like 12 to 20 people. And so everyone will sit down and eat together, family style. You know, there's one rice cooker and everyone's got chopsticks and grabbing out of the same plate. It's just like the homestead. <laughs> yeah, it is. And one of the recipes I really love that I highly encourage everybody to try is your breakfast fried rice. Yeah. It's so good. And you said yeah. that was one of your mom's recipes. Yeah, I grew up on that. I ate that so many mornings growing up. Um, yeah, it's a very, very simple recipe and I, I eat it whenever I need some comfort. Um, and also my mom immigrated here in 1990. She met my dad in Vietnam. And when she moved here, um, she learned how to cook in more of a Western way from my grandma Steger, which was like just classic kind of old school Minnesotan food. Which brings us, thank you. And that brings us back to Will's mom Grandma Steger, and the experiences you had around the family table. Do you want to say a little bit about that, Will? Because I think you bring that ascetic to the homestead. Yeah, I, I was a big family, Catholic family, with 10 kids, uh, mom and dad, and we had one big long table with the parents on one end and, and a bench, bent, two benches and five people. So we, we, we read eight, and the dinner time was always communal, of course. And back in the 50s and 60s, uh, dinner was more communal. I mean, people came back wasn't such a thing as a McDonald's even then, but it, but it was a very important thing for us. We had a lot of growing young bodies and uh, uh, the parents had like a regular milk machine that you would see in a cafe, you know, a gallon, a gallon jug, you'd fill that up and there'd be a couple of those on the table. My mother was a farm, farm girl from uh, North St. Paul, Maida Midai, raised again on a family of 10 there. And she was the youngest and uh, got st stuck with her and her other sister doing a lot of the cooking for most of the other ones were boys and uh, they, they cooked on the wood stove and it was the good old days at that time. But, uh, but her recipes were very uh, sweet. You would say from scratch, everything was made. Uh, they got the basics, you know, the, everything was baked and there's always a dessert and, uh, and always, there was always plentiful food. There was never a, a shortage of food, which was, you appreciate that as you get older when you realize what the cost of food is for 12 people. But, uh, but and we lived, we lived simply. We had um, six boys up in the upstairs, kind of an attic type place. All six boys were up there that got me in shape for expeditions because I, <laughs> I used to confined. And we got along fairly well for a family. We had in the, ba in the bathroom, you got seven minutes each morning. It was a regular <laughs> clock. Ma would call out next. And then there'd be the bag, bag lunches as you go out the door, your name was on the lunch and, and Ma was so great that the lunches were you know, tailored a little bit for each kid's taste. And it was a very special time. And, and, uh, but again, it was community around the food. Uh, my dad might have a business associate or we might have a friend over. They're always welcome to sit down and, 
and, and have that wonderful meal. And then the cleanup, uh, the boys, were, I was second to the oldest and Tom and I were in charge of dishes, washing. I, I, Tom washed, I dried. Uh, so the boys uh, did the washing and cleanup afterwards. Uh, but it, it was a, a wonderful family and we learned a lot from it. But Ma's recipes are in, in the book. We, uh, we kind of uh, dumbed down the sugar content in some of them, especially in the cookies. And the oatmeal, oatmeal cookie is my favorite. It's almost, a, almost like a bar you could uh, eat on an expedition, very, very healthy. But uh, so that was reflected in, in the book. My mother kept uh, her recipes in a little spiral notebook. Everything was written, and uh, and then we made copies of that, and then uh, some of some of those copies are, are some of those are directly in uh, in the book itself. Well, it, your mother really showed how she cared for people through her food. I think you have a wonderful story in the book, and I'm not going to share too much about it, but I think you can quickly tell us about the apple pie that she set up for you. <laughs> yeah, we were at North Pole. We were crossing the Arctic Ocean in '95. We went left Russia. And we arrived at the pole, I mean, um, you know, two months later, and we were just thinking, you know, we really beat up a little bit. And we still had to go down, we we're traversing, we still had 600 miles to go, but the plane lands and uh, out comes, a, uh, uh, there's in a kind of a storm, this frozen apple pie and <laughs> the wash of the airplane, it just rolled right down the, almost went in the water, but it hit, hit a pressure ridge and stopped. But here was my mom made this, this, uh, pie and gave it to one of the photographers and it made it by just good fortune. I think a lot of Providence uh, all the way to the pole and, and it was cooked and frozen and we warmed it up. We shared it with the six team members and it was really, really a special thing. It was on Earth Day 1995 actually that the, uh, the air apple pie arrived. And then, you know, um, a lot of the, uh, the older brothers, well, older kids were brothers and uh, yeah, and when school let off, uh, there was an exodus. Uh, some some brothers would hitchhike around the country. Bob Rita Mace brother did a lot of lot of adventures like that. A brother that bike cross country and always took off north, you know, to start an expedition. And my, for myself, my mom would always make me a big bag full of uh, these meatloaf sandwiches, enough for three days. And uh, so she they dropped me off at the freight yards in North Minneapolis. So. <laughs> I'd hop the freight and when you're on a freight, sometimes you can't get off. So I had you know, enough food there, got me along on the uh, road and I, I actually rationed those if things got tight on me. And then I arrived at the beginning of the expedition and then hitchhiked back to get back. You know, and actually that uh, meatloaf sandwich is in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. Rita yeah. May perfected or took your mom's meatloaf recipe and scaled it down for you know a smaller family size, but it's a fabulous recipe. Yeah, yeah, that's a farm. Definitely, a meatloaf is a, a you know farm farm style dinner. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. And many, of, like you said, many of your moms, um, the ginger, the oatmeal cookies, the ginger snap cookies, the um, the apple pie, they're all in the book, along with. Um, there was a mac and cheese recipe that she had that's yep. absolutely delicious. Yep. And so what's been fun is that Rita made ah. also took a number of those recipes. Ah. And as you said, we lightened them up and um, made them a little healthier because they are, you know, they are of a different generation. Rita May, can you talk about that process too, about how we selected recipes? Well, really, I just picked the ones I'd eaten so much and my favorite ones um, ones that I have a lot of memories attached to and um, ones that I ask my mom to make for me whenever I go home and visit her yeah which is really lovely and the other lovely thing is um, you know Rita May you've traveled all over the world just as Will has and what he acknowledges in the intro to the book is the fact that you guys have both explored and both experienced wow. Um, this different hospitality from around the world. I want you each to think a little bit about that and tell us a story of a particularly memorable meal when you experienced another culture or hospitality in a particular way. Do you want to start reading me and then we'll go to Will? Sure. Um, there was once in Northern Vietnam, um, I was with like three of my friends and my boyfriend were all on our motorcycles going on a road trip up there and we were in um, like a rural area in the countryside and um, there was like a Coca-Cola stand on the side of the road and the sun was going down and we didn't know where we were gonna stay that night. 
and we pulled over and we asked the lady um, at the, the pop stand, um, you know, anywhere we can stay tonight, you know, just for the evening because we we're going to travel on the next day. And she invited us to come in and stay at her house with her family for an entire week. She took us to the markets with her to go uh, grocery shopping and she would cook every meal for us. And um, there is another time we were walking by um, a group of uh, Vietnamese men. Um, it was like a, they were having a, a meeting, but it was like 12 noon and they were partying and um, sitting around uh, like uh, plates of like roasted duck and roasted meat just on the floor. And we're, they were drinking and we were like, what's going on? Like, oh, this is just <laughs> our town meeting. You know, this is the local meeting at the school. We're like, great. <laughs> Thanks for having us. <laughs> I love that. That's, that's yeah. so great. That's so great. And then, Will, I know that you've got a ton of stories. So don't, you know, we still want people to buy the book, so don't give them all away. <laughs> but, <laughs> but tell us one. I, you know, that's, that's the fun of these campfire yeah. dinners, that all of these, these stories, Rita May's stories and Will's stories get told. Well, you know, there, it was 1918 or, or, or 2018. It was three, four years ago. I was, I was traveling, uh, hauling a canoe sled I'd been out for a long time. There's a village of Black Lake it was about 50, 60 miles uh, that I'd left a week before. I'd passed through a three day storm and I'd taken a day off. It was really cold and windy at the end of this huge lake. And uh, towards the afternoon, I heard a snowmobile coming and snowmobile came by and uh, there was a, a native hunter and uh, his wife. And they said, oh, we're going up top of the hill here and have a roast and said, why don't you come up and join us? So. I, and I got dressed and it took me about an hour to ski up there. They had a fire going already and uh, meet. They had just, uh, uh, he had just come back from a caribou hunt and uh, shot five caribou and, and they shared their food, by the way. They, he brought the caribou in. The, he gave the three of three of the five were gave to the people that didn't have enough food or the elderly. But uh, here they were roasting it. They had a whole head that was roasting in the fire, caribou head and a tongue. And uh, so they gave me at first the best food, which is which was the uh, tongue, and I was kind of shy. I I just didn't want to eat their best food, and I, I I declined. And then the and the, and the his wife uh, uh, Bernadine said in real openly, but real directly, kind of, but very kindly. And she said, you know, in our culture, if you turned down like that you're you're insulting the culture and I oh yeah because I didn't want to eat your best piece so I, yeah I learned a, even a lesson there at age 70 years old you know so I ate the tongue and we we had just great roast um, her husband had made a whole just a regular bed of pine 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 balls and that was as comfortable as anyone's li you know living room it was 30 below and we had such a great time that evening and then uh and, and then at the end I said what uh, the head, the head was all, they burnt all the fur off it and, and she was putting it in a plastic bag and she says, that's for the kids. <laughs> she had five kids at home. So the, the, the brain in the head is the best. You probably broil it and they're very, very native, but this was a real, real far north, right in the border of the t territories. But I've had so many, uh, you know, encounters with native people this way. I mean, all through the last 60 years, I mean, I, I've met some of the greatest people up there and and in these villages, you know, they, um, it's always kind of a story when I just show up, there's a white guy and comes up, you know, with a, uh, a dog sled and, and, and people aren't even on the land anymore. And, and then another generation later, I show up again. And, and some of these communities I've been in for three, three and a half generations, I've come in and, and uh, kind of a legend in certain areas, all of a sudden I show up, they don't know who I am. <laughs> I show up. Oh, you must be Will. Yeah, but in doing so, I got I got to know the people, the families that slept on their floors, ate everything. I prefer eating what the native people eat. You know, it's mostly mostly eating meat in the far north, and yeah, it's really yeah. the best way of survival, and it's the best food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and you know, Rita May. I think one of the things you also do so well is you deal with, you know, huge numbers of people one day and then just a couple of people the next day. Can you talk a little bit too about how you toggle between, 
you know, cooking for a lot of people and then knowing that you've got to scale back and just cook for, for one or two, because that's an art in itself. Yeah, I mean, um, either way, I like to make sure people feel free when they're scooping food onto their plate. So really, it's just when it's a smaller group, um, usually it's people who I, I know and were there for the whole summer. So I kind of know what their needs are. Um, yeah, so I, I just always make sure to make enough no matter what. I think that's super important because, um, you know, you always feel like there's bounty, right? Yeah. So that's great. Um, that we did have another question about um, how, again, I think one of the things that's so interesting to me in the recipes or in the cookbook, many of them are either vegan or gluten-free and, and, you know, and yet you're not consciously vegan or gluten-free, but you're able to um, accommodate people that have, you know, those dietary needs and preferences. Talk a little bit about how you do that without, like, where do you, where do you get your ideas from? Because I think people would be interested in knowing that too. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why I first started cooking was to just make more plant-based recipes, not because that's my diet, just because it allows me to be more creative. Um, so, I mean, in the book, there are a lot of gluten-free <laughs> Uh, plant-based, also lots of meat recipes and even grain-free recipes. Um, they're, they're just recipes that you can, you can alter them very easily by adding meat or even um, I use raw cashews a lot to make um, like a kind of like cheesy sauce for pastas. Uh, yeah. Well, because a lot of them, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't realize until I saw you make them that they had been adjusted. And so they're super creative that way. And yeah. um, and I also know that, like you said, you use cashews. I know that you've used, you use a lot of really interesting grains too, mm -hmm. which is super important. Um, I think we need, you know, we're seeing more grains. They're so wholesome and they're so satisfying mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's you know, it's it's really fun to see how you bring those you know, into the kitchen and introduce them to people that might not be familiar with them. Yeah. And like, just because a recipe is gluten-free, like doesn't mean that there's not a pasta on the side. Or right. Right. Or, right. You know, or, right. Or I'll make a gluten-free cookie and a normal cookie. Yeah. 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 That's wonderful. And then the other thing I think people would like to know is how far in advance do you plan out your menus? Um, Usually I'm in the parking lot of the grocery store just making a list. Um, I, I'll make a lot of repeat recipes and at least one new recipe to try. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And Will, I think the other thing, you know, that really came through to me when we were talking and cooking and eating together is how mindful you are of food as energy because you're so incredibly active um, and you're really, you know, not to get too personal, but you're really conscious of, of what you put in your body every day. And it's why you're so healthy. Can you, is that, I mean, how did you come into that? How did you learn that? Well, you know, I, I've been active all my life, but, um, but it goes beyond uh, activity. Um, for me, me, life is about inspiration. And, uh, and I, I'm, I can maintain my inspiration really at a higher level with a good diet, mm -hmm. especially the older you get or the more sedentary you get, you really have to be mind, mindful of what you're putting into your, your body. And, uh, and I, I've been aware of food uh, oh, ever since I can remember. I had a, my first vegetable garden was when I was eight years old with my, my mother kind of accommodating at me. But so I had that natural interest and a natural interest of, of clearing land and raising large gardens with the idea of storing. Our root cellars used to be filled with uh, root crops and you walk into root cellar in October, it's just filled with it. And we'd, that's what we'd eat all, all winter long. And so, and I've always been, uh, I've, I've always taken the route of simplicity, uh, uh, both in my possessions and the way I live I've taken on complicated projects and educational projects. That's the kind of bane of my life is fundraising there. But the reason I've been successful in so many things that I've done is I've, I've kept a simple life. I don't, I don't really have much personal needs, but it's reflected in my diet. Uh, very simple. And, I, and I, to me, a, a product of a 
of a good meal as something that you could eat the next day and then the next day and then the next day. Uh, and in simple food, you, you do crave it that way. And uh, so uh, that's been, you know, and, and then on the expeditions, of course, it's so demanding. Uh, and if you're taking a long expedition or even I'm leaving on a 60 day expedition, which is going to be really tough. I need about 68,000 calories, but if I'm not mining my diet and I'm not getting the right calories and the balanced diet, I'll, I'll really go down hard. In fact, it'll be really quite dangerous because, uh, when you get frazzled, your mind is not in the present moment. So it's a matter of, uh, survival and, and, and quality that way. That's what's so cool about expeditions because you really have to, you have to think of the long run. And then um, I also think that way, uh, I'm a, a real committed to eating a lot of fresh food. Uh, I mean, I, when I'm in the city, it's a really, there's a plentiful here. I eat meat sometimes. Uh, I wouldn't consider myself a real meat eater. I eat uh, meat sometimes on the expedition because you need that type of protein. But down in the city, I have, a, I have a tendency of just eating more fresh. So the more live food you can do, the less cooking. And when I prepare my food, like my oatmeal every day, I do chia seeds and so forth. But I just get that water to a boil in a cast iron pot and then I turn it off. I basically don't boil it down. I just uh, enough to get it really so it's cooked, but then it's really the fresh, fresh foods like that are, are, are so important. Great, thank you. Um, you know, one of the things I, I just wanna kind of talk about as we, begin to think about allowing other people to ask questions, not just me, is how the three of us have worked together. And this book was so much fun because it really speaks to the values that are embedded in the Steger Homestead, which are collaboration, right? I mean, Rita May is a phenomenal cook and she really has a voice and aesthetic. And um, she and I had so much fun just testing recipes and deciding, you know, what we um, what we'd try out and what we thought belonged and didn't belong. Will had a hand in it because he's very clear about um, health and nutrition and storytelling and ease. And one of my favorite quotes from Will is, you know, recycling is great, but if you didn't buy it, you didn't have to recycle it. <laughs> and, and so we were very, very conscious about um, uh, no waste. And you know, I, I think the other thing that comes through, especially in working with Rita May, is that it's really joyful work. <clears throat> Being in the kitchen with Rita May and, um, and sitting around the table with Will is just so much fun. And Rita May really invites everybody into the kitchen and makes them, and Will makes them all feel welcome. So that's, that was a big part of working on the book together. Yeah. Um, and so I just followed everybody around with a pen and took. No, is it? I've got to put my two bits here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The book for me was a privilege over the last four years. Of, yeah. uh, I knew Beth before, but we really got to know each other. We spent a lot of time together up north and down here. And uh, you're so generous. And I've learned so much from you on sustainability. Yeah. I mean, oh yeah. my God, you're you're just you're so humble too. <laughs> <laughs> so generous. <laughs> well, you're, so you're such a spark plug. <laughs> so are you both you're both wonderful and i can't wait to get back up there again and be with you know rita may in the kitchen and come up and see you will and we're gonna let everybody else in because we have oodles of questions and um and so i'm gonna hand it back over to rob who's gonna read those questions out for us well thanks so Hi, much rob. for inviting me to the screen beth and for that fascinating conversation rita may and will it's just so much fun sitting by your mm. fire and listening to your stories what a treat um, hi everyone, my name is Rob Gowdy. I'm the events manager for Friends of the Hennepin County Library. And as Beth said, I'm happy to join the program tonight to moderate the audience Q&A. So if you have a question for our trio of authors, if you could please click the Q&A icon on the bottom center of the screen and log your question there, that would help us out a lot. And with that, let's get started. Um, we have a question from Alo or Alo, A-L-O. And they are asking, it sounds like maybe you know him or her, what local ingredient substitutions have pleasantly surprised you when adapting Vietnamese cuisine for a Northern climate? Soups didn't always have the most extensive international aisle. Um, well, uh, an ingredient used in all Vietnamese food, uh, maybe like 95% of Vietnamese food is fish sauce. 
And um, in the Northwoods, we go mushroom hunting a lot. We have a lot of dried morels around and you can actually make fish sauce out of mushrooms, out of dried mushrooms. That's one thing that we can do. <laughs> Great. Our next question is from Sharon. I love wild rice and get it every year from leech and net lakes. It seems so lightly filling, has subtle texture and leaves me feeling so positive. Do you have any wild rice entrees that you prepare? Does the center help protect the indigenous wild rice patties? Yeah, we, sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rita, man. I'm gonna think, yeah, we have, yeah, we do have um, a number of wild rice recipes. We've got a great soup. We have fabulous, um, the uh, mushrooms that Rita May referred to, John Ratzloff, our photographer is an incredible forager. So we have a lot of wild mush, uh, wild mushroom and um, uh, wild rice combinations. And so take it from there, Rita May. Yeah, there's also a black bean and wild rice burger in the cookbook. And this one's special because it stays intact and you can throw it on grates over a fire. They're grillable and they're really filling. And the next question I'd like to have each of you answer. Uh, Gail asks, what's your favorite childhood recipe and what's your favorite adult recipe? So Beth, why don't you kick us off? Oh gosh, that's not fair. I mean, it's like <laughs> asking who's your favorite kid? I, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> my favorite recipe is the thing I made yesterday, right? That I really loved. Um, I don't know. I mean, one of the my favorite recipes in the cookbook, frankly, is the ginger snap cookies that will that are in from Will's mom's cookbook that Rita Mae and I adapted. Um, and they're fabulous. And those were the same kind of cookies that I, my grandmother made and I grew up with. So that's one of my childhood favorite recipes that I brought forward into this book. And then um, my favorite recipe of Rita Mae's, boy, there is a fabulous uh, spanakopita pasta in there. And then also, I think I mentioned the blistered tomatoes and the avocado toast is amazing. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in there. So. Will, favorite childhood recipe? Favorite yeah, I, I think it was the goulash. <laughs> I think we have a recipe like that. And there's there's so many uh, recipes to choose from, from, from Rita May, but um, uh, of course the cabbage salad. And um, and I'm, I'm a big fan of just be beans and rice. I just love that combination. And then whatever kind of a, comes out of the vegetable, you know, especially end of the seasons, potatoes, uh, uh, peppers and tomatoes and that. So really simple. And Rita May? Um, favorite childhood recipe, um, uh, ice ball veggie lasagna. That's actually the first thing I ever wanted to learn how to make when I was little, was how to make lasagna. And I love that it would take me all afternoon to make it. Well, I would take my time to make it. It does take a long time, but I would make it take even longer. Um, as an adult, I mean, uh, the tomato tofu with scallions. Um, it's a Vietnamese recipe. Um, it's just uh, tofu that's uh, braised in tomatoes. And I would eat that in Northern Vietnam twice a day. One time I did that for two weeks straight. Never got tired of it. <laughs> that sounds yeah, I can attest, we tested that a number of times. It's yeah. really rock solid. It's so yeah. good. Yeah, sorry. We hope that's in your next cookbook, Rita May. That sounds amazing. Yeah. I, I know I did, Beth mentioned- No, her. it's in this one, Rob. Oh, yeah. it's, it's in this one, yeah. Um, and then we also had a question about the blistered tomatoes. Uh, what are blistered tomatoes, someone asked. Um, they are like cherry tomatoes. You just put a little, just like a couple drops of oil in a really hot pan. You put the tomatoes on there, wait for them to get like nice and brown on the bottom. And then you shake the pan, maybe for like another 20 seconds, turn off the heat and just drizzle in some balsamic with the heat off so it doesn't burn. And then you're done, it'll take about two minutes. And there you go, easy and delicious. And my next question is for Will. This is from an anonymous questioner. Can you still eat sustainably during expeditions? How do you eat sustainably during an expedition? Yes, uh, good question. Um, you know, when I'm traveling in the north, uh, particularly in the polar regions, we, we bring all of our food. So we, we are we're rationed to the amount of weight. So we, we eat a kilo a day and within that kilo, a day we have to get 6,000 calories and uh, all the food that we we eat are, is organic. I basically shop at the co-op, sort of the co-op warehouses. And uh, we do believe it or not, a lot of, lots of vegetarian. We don't always have access to meat, especially in the polar regions. 
So uh, a lot of it's meatless. Uh, if I'm able, like I'm leaving in a couple months from now, hopefully uh, from the local people and get caribou or something like that, I'll definitely uh, char and salmon, definitely eat that. If uh, that's to me is the best food of all, if you can obtain it, but it's all, it's all uh, sustainably grown or harvested that we buy, of course. And, uh, and we buy it all local. We, uh, the, what we haven't talked about here is simple, simple food means local food means very local. We've done 20, 50 years ago, that we bought all, and we still buy local. Why? Because we're supporting the local farmer and you're not paying the transportation costs. Uh, we don't really, I've never had anything to do with factory farms or factory corn or so forth. But, um, but if you're being sustainable, you're, you're supporting families, local families. And, uh, and we're lo looking at the health of the planet, but I think we're looking more than just the health right now. It's the survival of our species that we're looking at. And it's survival of a lot of other species that are gonna go under. And the way, way uh, the solutions are the way we need to live is the sustainable live, working local. And, uh, and I got questions from friends of mine I thought I betrayed them because we had meat recipes. And, uh, but I think with the, the bad rap for meat is factory raised food. And we're talking about uh, pasture raised uh, chickens, uh, pigs. And, and in that, uh, the, the pasture raised animals actually uh, add to the sequestering of carbon with their hoofs and the manure and they're building up the soil which sequesters the carbon. So actually you can get carbon neutral that way if you really look at the, 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 the real facts of that. And then the animal also has lived, lived a very good life except for the last day of its life. And a lot of times I know, or most of the times I know the farm that the meat comes from. And if you're shopping from the co-op, you should take a look at that because you can find out just what farm it's coming from. And, and sometimes I know what the like pigs on expeditions we get, what the, what the animal was, what they ate uh, and so forth. So, you know, you have that connection with it and, and, uh, and it's very health, healthy for you, like fat. Uh, we have this thing with fat. Well, fat's very unhealthy for you if it's got nitrates and poisons in it. Uh, but when you're living in organic, uh, free-ranged animals, the fat of the of pig or chicken even, that's very good for your, your development of your brain materials and so forth. And um, I mean, that's something that was obvious to me 50 years ago. And, and uh, now they're just discovering here, you know, real food like that for real people, real minds. Uh, it's all very healthy and sustainable. On the theme of sustainability, we have another anonymous questioner who wants to know, are you able to compost up at the Steger Center or would bears be an issue? Yeah, we, we compost. Uh, uh, fortunately, we don't have too many visiting bears uh, these days, and, uh, but uh, we compost everything. Yeah, everything is, uh, not, nothing's wasted. And uh, the, uh, the beginning of this idea, original idea, this cookbook was about five years ago. I, I work uh, with Molly Reichardt, Molly Reichardt who uh, teaches architecture at Dunwoody. And, uh, and I, I also work with Molly in architectural instructions there. We were doing a, a, a schematic designs for the new dining hall. And at that point, you know, I thought, okay, we're gonna feed 60 people. And immediately I th think about all the plastic waste and the garbage. But then I had the idea then of, the, of creating a, a cookbook, a re regular manual that we could have. Of, uh, we could follow the recipes, but also being able to share that because it's real zero waste is what we're after. We waste very little at the homestead. Uh, we buy in bulk. Uh, we don't do plastic. Uh, uh, we, we don't have a lot of small bottles around, uh, but you really have to be mindful of your waste. Um, we have a plastic epidemic. We're drowning in our plastic. And if people ask me, what do I do? Well, your first step to do is start looking at your plastic, your garbage. You're not going to be able to change right away. But with that in mind, that's a good good start of just understanding because you, you're you going to follow instructions. If, if someone wants to know 10 things they can do, well, forget it. You, don't, you have to have a consciousness of what you're doing. You have to have an understanding of your your reaction of your what what you do has a reaction and that reaction can be really good for the planet or it can be the usual what's going on really harmful for the planet and it's a matter for me it's a moral imperative on a consciousness uh and building that consciousness is something that we always should be looking at and then in these days when we're so frazzled we have another war going on now we have climate change 
we have uh, everything, the COVID, this whole thing. People are just so frantic. We're so divided. Everybody's got their opinion. Uh, we need to really get, you know, maybe raise a garden if you're fortunate to have a plot of land or a community garden. Get close to the world. Get close to a plant. You know, spend spend that time in the garden. Share your garden work. Share your cooking. Get you know, get close to your simple foods, and you'll find a, a sense of peace uh, to that. A sense of peace that is part of our spiritual heritage as a human being of sharing that and being close to the earth. And that's really what the the, the Steger Homestead Kitchen is about. It's really uh, uh, building that consciousness, that good feeling, that good feeling, health and spirit and creativity. Just truly inspiring words, Will. Thank you for that generous answer. Uh, dovetailing off of that, Rita May, can you talk about running a zero waste kitchen and uh, just about how do you utilize the garden up at the Steger Center? Yeah, so um, basically try to make everything myself if I can. Um, anything that comes in plastic or a container, I think to myself, you know, how can I do this on my own? So um, we'll make our own yogurt, our own almond milk, um, our own broths out of chicken carcasses or onion skins, whatever we got, corn cobs or asparagus tips, the butts of the mushroom. Um, and uh, we also do a lot of canning. Um, and so we'll take our vegetables from the summertime so that we can have them also in the winter. Great tips all. Yeah. Um, we'll get back to some of more fun questions from the audience here. Um, Alo's back and wants to know, what ingredient above all others do you wish we had a cold hearty version of so you could grow it here in Minnesota? Rita? Um, Citrus. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Avocados. <laughs> Do you add a lot of citrus to your dishes, Rita May? Is that always a. Um, I'll buy, I'll treat myself to maybe a couple lemons a week, but I use a lot of vinegar to brighten dishes up. Yeah, lots of like balsamics or apple cider vinegar. And um, on the topic of Rita May in the kitchen, how do you handle the volume of food for 25 plus people an anonymous attendee wants to know? Um, I try to keep a level head. Um, I really enjoy cooking. I think that helps a lot. Uh, I could cook all day. I feel really lucky to have a job that allows me to have total control in the kitchen that I get to manage. Um, there's never really a problem with the food being finished because most people there are doing manual labor all day and they're super hungry. Yeah. And now we have a very fun question from John. Sometimes humans and dogs enjoy the same healthy foods. Are there any recipes for your dog sled family members that we might share with our four-legged friends? Do we do yeah. cooking for the dogs? Yeah, you know, we, in fact, we work with Science Diet, the vets at Science Diet for the food. Yeah, and this was 30 years ago. And, and Science Diet got their, they, they used to cure diseases in zoo animals through diet. That's where they started in the 30s and 40s. So, and when we started expeditions in the 80s, uh, they were my sponsor and I had the access to some of the best vets. And we really approached the diet of the dogs uh, in, a, in a very thoughtful and thorough and scientific way. And we developed a special food called endurance. And endurance was uh, uh, equivalent to us. It was, had, it was a kilo of, uh, uh, of food. It was in room temperature, it was like peanut butter consistency. And then we had a regular box with like cart, egg cartons or they, when it was hot, they laid it in the, these egg cartons. So each, each square had an exact, exact kilo which was a, their exact di their diet. So it was their, their diet that was very well balanced. And like in Antarctica, we traveled 222 days and we traveled through two winters. And, um, and if our dogs, if, you're, if your diet has any flaws in it, it's around a day 150 is where that's going to come. And that's both for people and dogs. But um, date, uh, day 150 would put us at the coldest place in the world, the most isolated place of the world. But the dog's diet was absolutely perfect. They came out with, you know, stronger muscles, strong fur, oily fur. So, you know, like people, the dog's diets were really very, very thoughtful, very thorough, weighted, weighted properly. So each one had a certain amount each day, so. 
Um, we've had a few questions about writing process still. And I know that it sounds like Beth followed you both around and took down copious notes. But could you tell us now, once you gathered all the information, what was the next step? How did you narrow it down and uh, get it closer to the book that we hold in our hands today? You know, I wanted the book to represent the flow of life at the homestead. And so the chapters are organized by garden, fireside feasts, um, you know, uh, gatherings, uh, pantry. They, they really reflect how, how Will and people that stay there for long periods of time live and how Rita Mae thinks about food. So it was a way to um, organize the recipes and then also to organize the stories because in my mind as a food writer, recipes are stories with happy endings, right? Nobody wants to write a recipe for something that doesn't work. And, um, and so it was an attempt to, to really reflect life there. And that was always in the back of my mind as I gathered the recipes and decided what stories to choose. And it was a lot of listening and a lot of note taking. And as a storyteller, I wanted to be able to capture those nuggets and then bring them together much the way you would a recipe actually, like what really goes with what. And so it's, it's kind of an organic process, but a lot of it has to do with just being there and paying attention, which is so much of what the homestead is about is just being there and paying attention. And we have time for one final question, but before we do, I just want to bring out the See Your Homestead Kitchen cookbook <laughs> and remind you that if you have not yet purchased it, you absolutely must. If you thought tonight was fun gathered around our virtual hearth, um, this book will feed you for the rest of winter. And I hate to tell you, we've got at least four to six weeks left. <laughs> so go and get the book because the stories are heartwarming, the recipes are heartwarming and you'll love them. And we'd ask that you consider making your purchase uh, through our independent bookseller partner, Majors and Quinn, by the link in the chat that I'm about to drop in. When you make your purchases locally, you are helping our local literary community to thrive. So thank you so much for, for making your purchase through Majors and Quinn. And then our final question, I know we've shared a lot of favorite recipes today, but we've had at least two people ask, what is your absolutely absolutely favorite recipe in the book? So I'm not gonna make Beth start. Maybe Will this time. Will, what's your favorite recipe in the book? <laughs> well, I talk about goulashes there. I mean, I like I every every recipe that uh, Rita Mae does. I mean, I, I it's, it's like Beth said, it's like, what's your favorite kit here of 12 kids? <laughs> uh, you know, it, they're all so wholesome and and they're they're all so great. So I, I can't actually choose one. It's hard hard decision. Rita, can you say? Um, well, okay, yeah, it's really hard for me to pick one, but I think I have an idea what might be Will's favorite because I make it for him all the time. It's this banana bread. It's a grain free yeah. banana bread. Yeah. It's tried and true. I know the recipe off the top of my head, and I'll always make an extra loaf and bring it up to Will's cabin. For him. But my favorite recipe, um, the Vietnamese steak salad uh, with hard boiled eggs. Uh, it's something I grew up on. Um, it, it's so good. It's uh, you eat it over a bed of rice, and yeah, just call it a night. It's very. And good. it's pictured in the book beautifully. You want to eat the page when you see the picture yeah. of that. <laughs> and my mom actually uh, took that picture. She made that. She made that picture in the food. So and amazing. It. Yeah. it is. Ab that is absolutely delicious, and it's the perfect thing to serve a lot of people if you're having yeah. a big you know, light dinner or a lunch or something like that, because you can really expand it. You know, it's hard for me as a writer to separate the stories from the recipes. So one of my other favorite recipes is the Homer smoked fish pasta salad, yeah. right? Because Homer is the homestead cat who kind of <laughs> snuggles inside near the fire in the wintertime. And in the um, summer, he just kind of sleeps in the sun wherever he flops down, mostly near Rita Mae outside, right? Yeah. Lying outside on the porch, right? Yeah. Homer's amazing. He's survived so many winters by himself. <laughs> 
And uh, yeah, one time, um, one of our homestead friends, Linda Nervik, she brought um, a bunch of salmon and we were all eating it. I think I made some fish tacos and uh, Will was just like, make sure you give some to Homer. Like when we eat good, he eats good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and with Homer the cat, we bring our program to the close. Uh, thank you so much, Will, Rita Mae, and Beth. As I said before, it's just been such a pleasure pleasure to be gathered around the virtual homestead hearth with you tonight. And finally, before we close, I do have a couple of additional resources to share. First, uh, our very own Beth Dooley has all the insight to help you make delicious locally sourced meals on her website with her Bare Bones Cooking Club. So I'm going to drop a link in the chat for that. And second, as Christy promised earlier, we are sharing recommendations from library staff that invite you to taste the depth of the cookbook collection at Hennepin County Library. So click the links in the chat to access these helpful resources or to order your copy of the Steger Homestead Kitchen. Um, so once again, thank you everyone out there in Zoom land for joining us tonight. And thanks to our special guests. What a heartwarming evening this has been. Everyone have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.